If you can hear this message, listen closely. To the exiled, misunderstood, or upside down, this is your message of hope. When problems come, use them. When enemies persecute you, love them. These struggles are a fire, refining you into gold. Look around. You are not forgotten. You are not alone. Challenge what is expected of you. This world is not your home. You are different. All right, we are in a two-part series called Different. Now, if you missed last week's sermon, uh, you can go to Facebook, like us on Facebook, and you can see Scotty's message, the entire message there on Facebook. Uh, but if you miss, let me summarize it uh, for you for just a little bit. We're, again, we're in a two-part series called Different, and we're taking our passage from 1 Peter. Now, 1 Peter is obviously written by a guy by the name of Peter, and I love reading about Peter in the Bible because I genuinely connect with Peter because I feel like his personality and my personality are very, very, very much the same, Okay. For example, uh, when Peter was with, with Christ, because he was one of the three, the close three disciples. You have the Apostle Peter, and you have uh, James and John, you know, the, the John who loved to say, I'm the one that Jesus loved. But anyway, Peter's right there with him the whole time. And, and, and Peter's talking with Christ, and, and Christ asked this question. He said, so who do people say that I am? And then they started throwing out all these answers. You know, oh, you're this prophet. You're this person. You're this person. And then he says, who do you say that I am? And Peter, man, he's all ready. He was, I, I feel like he had it in his heart. He's like, okay, I know this one. I got this one. I'm going to go to the front of the class on this one. He says, you are Christ. You are the Messiah. And, and Jesus is like, Peter, you are right, man. You get to go to the head of the class because I'm going to build my church on you. And man, Peter is just like his head's going, getting big. And then, and then, uh, then Christ says this thing. He's like, I mean, if you read, if you're reading the passage, you know, he's, you're following on. And it's just like maybe two, two verses later, Christ is like, okay, now I'm going to go to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me, but don't worry. I'm going to raise from the dead. And Peter's like, no, you're not going to do that. And, it said, and, the, and I love it because it says, Peter pulled Christ aside and rebuked him. Now, let me just put it in this way. Peter's rebuking God. Okay, and then what does Jesus call him? He says, get behind me, Satan. So, I mean, here's Peter, you know, he's flying high, man. I am the rock. God's going to build his church on me. And then Jesus said, you're Satan, okay? You're the devil. Stop, okay? So, you know, Peter had to come crashing down. And that's kind of the way that I am. I'm kind of like, the, I feel like I'm a lot like Peter, you know, to boom, up and down, and then, you know, so I connect with Peter. Now, the, where we're picking up in our, in our series here, um, we're picking up where Peter's writing his, his, his epistle, his, 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 he's got two books there that he's writing, and he's writing them to a group of Christians that are in Rome. So let me give you a little historical background at, that, at this time, okay? Rome is under the um, direction of, the, the, of Caesar, which his name was Nero. Okay, Caesar Nero, and he was just a really, really insane guy, and when I talk about insane, I'm talking about he was so focused on himself about how he loved to build, and he was God on earth, and and, and, and he was like, that's what he viewed himself as, as he was a God, and everybody else was, was, was underneath him. And so he loved building things that, that historians actually say that he's the one that set Rome on fire so he could burn it all down and then rebuild it to, because he had this, this I am, I can do this because this is who I am and I am God. You know, that's kind of the way he viewed himself. Well, when he burnt everybody's houses down, everybody got a little bit mad at him, okay? So in order to deflect it off of himself... He decided to point it all at the Christians. Well, it wasn't me. You need to listen because I am Caesar. It was the Christians' fault. And at that point, 
he decided that it was time to start persecuting Christians. Now, when I talk about persecution, I'm not saying he just went on Facebook and slandered them on Facebook. I'm talking about he went in and he started doing really, really bad stuff. Have you ever heard of the Colosseum in Rome? It's, it's a place that it was a big, um, kind of like what we would say, the, the Superdome or the Alamo Dome or whatever you want to call it. It was a place where people went and they sat down and they watched an event. And what he would do is he would get uh, various uh, Christians. He'd pull Christians out because, they're, remember, he's the one that they're blaming on Rome. And because they burnt down Rome, uh, they deserve a death. And so he would put them all out in this um, Colosseum, and then he'd let loose wild animals, and they would viciously rip these people apart. And then he would do all kinds of stuff. In, in fact, Scotty, in his previous message, said that the term Roman candle came from when Nero would put wax all over these Christians, and then to light up his parties, he would set the Christians on fire with wax covered them. Now, that's persecution. That's what is going on when we get to this book of P that Peter's writing to this group of people, okay? And so with that in mind, kind of like a historical background of what's going on, you know, Peter begins to remind, remind them, listen, you need to stop focusing on all your problems, but allow those problems to begin to change you and begin to do something so that people can see that, hey, there's something different about these Christians. Why, what, why is it that... All of this is going on, but what is different? There's something different because they changed their focus. Their focus was on God and not their circumstances. And they allowed their circumstances to show their faith in God. Okay? It allowed their, uh, what was happening in their lives, they allowed them to show their faith in God and, and how strong their faith was in who they were in Christ. And so we're continuing in the same chapter where Scotty left off last week. And we're just going to pick up right, pretty much right where he left off with verse 13. Here we go. 1 Peter 1, verse 13. It says, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Prepare your minds for action. Keep sober in spirit. Fix your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now that prepare your minds for action, that's a military term. When Peter's talking to these people, he's saying, listen, you need to get ready for battle, okay? Because there's going to be things happening here that you need to be prepared. Your minds need to be prepared for battle, okay? And, and, and the problem was, again, here's your historical setting. All these people are dying. They're being tortured, literally tortured for Christ because they bear the name Christian. They just the, Christian means little Christ or Christ followers. They said, we're going to follow Christ. And because we're following Christ, Nero was persecuting them. And, and what happened, the tendency was then, was they were like, well, if I just kind of go with the flow and kind of, you know, just stop following Christ or just kind of fit in with everybody else of the Romans where they don't know that I'm a Christian, then I don't have to worry about being persecuted. And, and sadly, it, we're in the same predicament today because for many of us, the greatest obstacle to following Christ is our desire to fit in. I mean, we want to fit in with everybody else. I mean, there's a path that, that, that everybody's taken and everybody else is doing this. And, and so I don't want to be, you know, the, the oddball. I, I, I want to fit in with everybody else. Because some things happen when we become a follower of Christ Jesus. When we become a follower of Christ Jesus, things begin to change. Okay? So why does this matter? Why does it matter that, that, our, uh, that we need to do something different? Because we were not created to fit in. We were call, created to stand out. We were created to be different. God created us to be set apart. And, and the, problem, the problem with that is so many people wrongly believe that God's highest calling in their life is their happiness. Well, I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be happy. That's God wants me to be happy. And when God wants me to be happy, I can do whatever I want. I can, I can live any way that I want. 
because God wants me to be happy. And that's wrongly what a lot of people believe. They believe, hey, God wants me to be happy, so I don't really have to wait until I'm married. I, 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 God wants me to be happy. Or um, I don't have to, uh, I don't have to save up money for my family. I can spend it all on myself because I deserve to be happy. You know, I can have multiple partners. I deserve to be happy. Okay, but that's not, not, not what God is saying. God is saying, listen, you've been called to be different because when we believe that God wants us happy above all else. Discomfort, delay, risk, and suffering can't be God's will. If we believe that, hey, God wants us to be happy, delay or discomfort, that, that's, that can't be God's will. Can't be God's will, okay? I need it now, and I need it uh, at this moment. It, it's mine. I deserve to be happy, so I'm going to do whatever it takes to be happy, you know? Risk, suffering, wait, wait, no, 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 no. I can't, suffering can't be part of God's will because I deserve to be happy, no. You see, here's what we need to understand from the beginning. God does not exist to serve us. We exist to serve God. God did not create us because he was lonely. God doesn't need anything. If you read the Bible, it says God doesn't need anything. God doesn't need anything. But he created us because he wanted a relationship with us so we could serve him. I mean, he had angels. Created angels, you know, if he was lonely, why didn't he just, but because no, it's not God's plan. And so we continue with what Peter tells us. Let's continue because he's got more for us to see. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which were yours and your ignorance. I mean, he just kind of lays it out there. Listen. You had a lifestyle that you used to live before you were a follower of Christ, okay? You can't do that anymore because that's conforming your life to what you used to do. But like the Holy One, talking about God, but like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Everything you do, be holy. Because it is written, you shall be holy for I am holy. God is saying, listen, I am a holy God. Therefore, I want my followers, those who follow me, I want you to be holy. Because look, God's highest calling for you is not your happiness. God's highest calling for you is your holiness. And I feel like we get hung up on this word holy. I can't be holy. But do you even know what the word holy means? Because Paul you know, these two guys lived at the same time. Paul and Peter both lived at the same time. And historians say that they were killed by, ne both of them were killed by Nero for Christ, okay? And Paul pretty much says the exact same thing to a whole different group of, uh, of, of believers. And if you look in Ephesians, it's almost the exact same thing. He says, listen, that in reference to your former manner of life, you lay aside that old self. All that that you used to be, you don't do that anymore, because you are being, because which, which is being corrupted. Your old self is corrupted in accordance with the lust of deceit. Your old self, it, it, it's, it's bad. It, it's filthy, okay? It, it's really, really disgusting, your old self. So what you have to do, you need to be renewed in the spirit of your mind, just like Peter says, and put on the new self which is in the likeness of God, which has been created, which has been created in righteousness and holiness of truth. God says, listen, you are called to be a holy people. And I feel like a lot of times we're, again, we're caught up on that word holy. Like we've been told, oh, you cannot be holy. Well, no, Peter says it. And then Paul also says it. Both guys to the, at the same time said, listen, you are called to be holy in your life. So what, let's talk about that word. What does it mean? I like this word. It's a Greek word, hagios. It makes me think of that, what is that, Scottish dish, haggish, kind of, I guess it's what it is. <laughs> kind of makes me think of that, but not really. Hagios, it means to be holy, to be set apart, to be different, to be pure. 
And when God says, listen, I want you to be a holy people, he says, listen, I want you to be set apart. I want you to be different. Because, you know, in, in Scripture it tells us, it says, listen, broad is the path, is the gate, and wide is the path that leads to destruction. And then it says this, but listen, narrow and small is the path. Narrow is the gate and small is the path that leads to righteousness. So you got this broad path, and it says, on the broad path, many people are there. On the small path, few people are there. So if, if you're on the broad path, if you're doing what everybody else seems to be doing, then would you call that normal? That's what everybody's doing. If you're doing what everybody else is doing, you're normal, right? That's, that's normal. Normal is having multiple partners. Normal is, is living a life um, of getting plastered every week and getting stoned every week, and that's normal. Normal is living paycheck to paycheck. Normal is doing this. Normal is, 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 is everything that, that causes stress. Normal isn't working. If you look at it, normal doesn't work. So what's the opposite of normal? I love what Craig Rochelle says. Craig Rochelle is kind of like my hero guy that I follow, okay? He's a pastor in Oklahoma. He says, listen, if you're not normal, you're weird, okay? So if you're on the broad path, you're normal. But if you want to be weird, different, set apart, you got to do weird things, okay? Normal is this. Weird is this. Different is this. You mean I have to do things differently than everybody else? Yes, because if you're not different from the world, then you're not following Christ. If you're not different from anything else that everybody else is doing, you're not following Christ. Because Christ says, listen, when you become my follower, you do things different. You are different with the way you see your money. You're different with the way that you see your family. You're different with the way that you just view your coworkers. You're different. You mean I have to love that person who I hate? I can't stand? You don't understand how mean they are. I don't care. See, Christ doesn't, Christ, read, read the Sermon on the Mount. It's full of weird stuff, okay? It really is. If you don't know where the Sermon of the Mount, Mount is, it's in the book of Matthew. Just go, go read the book of Matthew. I'm not going to tell you where it is because I want you to read the whole book. <laughs> go in there and look at it. But it's great stuff. I mean, and it's weird. Christ is like, love your enemies. Do good to those who persecute you. Those people who are doing bad, mean things to you, you are supposed to go do stuff. And what? That is so weird. Yeah, I know. Because you're not called to be normal. God calls you to be holy. You're holy in your life. You're different. And it's not about behavior modification. It's about spiritual transformation. God does something inside of you. When you become a new believer, God does something inside of you. Supernatural, he does something inside of you. You can't do it yourself. It has to be God working in you. He does a spiritual transformation inside of your life. And this helps you. It enables you to live a life that's holy, that is set apart. Because I'm telling you here, if you're here this morning and you're not a follower of Christ, you say, you know what? I don't know much about Christ. I'm, I'm not, I don't really need to, I don't really know about him. I don't, well, you're here. So you're at least interested. And so I'm going to call you a pre-Christian because I'm an optimistic fella. I like looking at the optimistic side of things. Always look on the bright side of life. Okay. We're doing spam a lot, and I'm, I'm the music director for that. But anyway, but it, it just popped in my head. But anyway, <clears throat> I'm an optimistic fella. So if you're here and you're a non believer, I'm going to call you a pre Christian. So technically, this sermon doesn't really apply to you, caveat, yet. Because when it, you do become a believer, then this sermon is not negotiable, this is a requirement. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, this, Jesus doesn't give you any options. He doesn't say, hey, listen, when you become a follower of me, you can be holy or not holy. I don't really care. That's not what he says. Paul and Peter both 
emphasize that, hey, when you become a believer in Christ Jesus, you're called to be holy. You're called to live a life that's different. And that's a whole series is on living a life that's different. When you find who you are in Christ, when you realize that Christ, listen, Christ did something inside of me. I'm different. You live a life that's different. It's not the same. You do, both of those guys, both Peter and Paul, if you remember, they said, listen, don't go back to that former, former self. That former self is dead. It no longer exists. You put on a brand new creature. You allow Christ to come inside of you and do a work inside of you where you're different. There's something different about the way you live your life, and people will notice. They're going to notice. You mean this person doesn't do this anymore? I mean, they, they're not going to get plastered with us every week? No? Well, what's different about them? Something's different. Something's different. Because you've allowed God to make you holy. You've allowed God to come into your life to make you holy. Now, when Lark and I were first married, we had this little bitty house in, in Indiana. Uh, okay, she's a Texan. Uh, that's my saving grace. I'm not. I'm a Hoosier. I'm from Indiana, okay? So some of you are like, okay, I'm leaving right now. Whatever you have to say doesn't even, please stay with me. I married a Texan, okay? That's, that's at least gives me some credit, right? Okay? At least give me a little bit. I'm smart, right? Smart. I married a Texan. So anyway, so we have this, when we first married, we lived at this house in Indiana. And um, one night, we were having... A discussion, if you know what I mean. Now, remember at the beginning, I said I'm kind of like emotional roller coaster, and I got a little excited, I guess you could say, and um, I put my foot through the wall. <laughs> I, I did. I, 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 I just got a little overcome, and I got so mad. <laughs> I kicked a hole in the wall. And then it dawned on me, your parents are coming over for supper later this week. Right there in that same room where you're going to have dinner. So what I did was I got a little drywall knife and I cut a neat little square removing all the evidence that something had happened and took it out and tried to kind of cover it up real quick. And then we had my parents over that evening. And I remember my dad looking around the room, and I don't know why. Maybe it was God using him in a way. But he looked at me, he looked at the wall, and then he looked at me, and he goes, was that something you had to confess for? Because <laughs> uh, I'm not talking about a behavior modification. There was something inside of me that was not like Christ. And I had to come to a place where I was like, God, You've got to do something in me. You've got to create in me a new creature. You've got to do something inside of me where it's a spiritual transformation. Because all of my exterior stuff, your exterior pretty much shows what's going on in the inside. You know, even the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Or uh, to put it in our language, what is inside is going to come out. And what was coming out of me was not like Christ. And so I had to say, God, there's something inside of me you've got to do. And I'm just saying, listen, all these years that afterwards that we've been married, not once have I put my foot through the wall or put my hand through the wall or done something like that. Why? Because I allow God to do something inside of me and allow him to create in me a clean heart. So this is what Paul says. I allowed a spiritual trans transformation to come inside of me. And when that happened, then other stuff began to flow out of me. It's a spiritual transformation. Living holy isn't the path to knowing Christ. Knowing Christ is the path to living holy. Okay? Um, when, when you live a life that you're following Christ, things begin to change. The way you treat your neighbors begin to change. The way if you actually get to know your neighbors <laughs> begins to change. 
the way you respond to those family members that you just can't stand begins to change. Because you allow God, you allow Christ to come inside of you, and he makes you holy because you're called to be holy. God's highest calling is not your happiness, it's your holiness. Yeah, God's okay with you being happy. I'm not saying that God doesn't want you to be happy. You have to live in in this one one bedroom apartment with six million kids or whatever, and you're just stressed. No, that's not what God is. That's not what I'm saying. That's not a sign of holiness. A sign of holiness is you are doing your best to follow in the footsteps of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul says this. He says, listen, model me as I model Christ. I'm following Christ. I'm living a life that is holy. And this is the way I like to put it. When you become a follower of Christ Jesus, Christ has reached you out of that former lifestyle. He's pulled you out. Just as like, I love this song they sang right before I got up here. It says, I am raised to life. Hallelujah, the Lamb of God. In other words, you were dead and foul and, and the inside of you was just gross. You were lost. But when you became a follower of Christ Jesus, Christ came to you and he lifted you and he pulled you out of there. Spiritually speaking, that's what he did. He pulled you out of that pit, that muck, that, that, that mud, that dirt and filth. And he pulled you out of that and he cleaned you up. And he got you going on the right path. And he said, now I want you to be holy. I want you to be like me. Live a life that's holy. Follow after me. And when you follow after me, you'll continually be holy. Like there's things in my life that I'm going along that God begins to point out. And he says, listen, Aaron, this is not holy. The way you just talked to your son was not holy. You need to go back and you need to tell him, listen, I'm sorry, I was wrong. The way you treated your wife, that was not holy. You need to go back and say, you're sorry. You know, holiness in, holiness has a good backup or a good reverse because you need to go back and you need to say, listen, I'm sorry, that was not like Christ. And then Christ says, okay, now let's, let's see how we can transform you to make you better so you can live a life that's weird. <laughs> That's different. It's not the same. So here's what I want to leave you with. Here's the question I want to leave you with. Okay? Does, your, does my life look noticeably different? Does the life I'm living look different than everybody else? Because remember, broad is the gate. Wide open is that gate. Many people are on it. And if you're doing the same thing that they're doing, what is going to make Christ attractive? Is that going to make Christ attractive? Why do they need Christ? If you are not different, if you're not living a life that's holy, why do they need Christ? So Christ says, listen, no, I have pulled you out of that. I have cleaned you up. Now I want you to live a life that's holy because I'm going to transform you. And you're not going to mess with that lifestyle anymore. I'm going to help you move along. And there will be times in your life as you're moving along that Christ comes in and he goes, hey, listen, that area right there is not holy. Let's transform that. And you allow God to come into your heart and begin to change you on the inside. And when he changes you on the inside, you begin to implement those spiritual disciplines and God helps you along. He helps you with those spiritual disciplines, and you're different. And all of a sudden, people are going, whoa, 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 whoa. Something's different. Best example that I know to give about that is my dad. Now, my dad's a preacher, but he wasn't always a preacher, okay? He, um, in fact, one one of the coolest uh, coolest things that happened was we went to a church, and we were, uh, when I was a kid, my dad was a preacher at this point. We walk into this church building, and um, <clears throat> my dad's sitting there. And this was a church where my dad grew up, okay? So, and this was a smaller community than Brownwood, okay? And if you want to take this, the city of Francisco, Indiana, 
and compare it to something around here, early looks like Abilene compared to Francisco, Indiana, okay? It's little bitty dinky. They have one gas station and a post office. That's it. I mean, if it's, this is one of those things you're driving along and you're like, wow, this is a nice town, wasn't it? You know, I mean, it's, it's, I mean you're, it's just like that. And you're through Francisco. So everybody knew everybody, and everybody knew everybody's business. And everybody knew my dad, okay? And we step into this church, and my dad introduces himself to the pastor who had been there since, since my dad was a kid. And he looked at my dad, and he said, you're Jim Terry? He's like, what are you doing now, Jim? My dad said, I'm a preacher. <laughs> And so he's standing up there, and this pastor begins to talk. And he said, listen, we have in our congregation this morning, we have Jim Terry. He said, and this is word for word, he said, I can remember when Jim Terry was one of the undesirables of our community. And that's exactly what he called my dad. He said, he was an undesirable. But God came into my dad's life at 20 years of age. And this is how he did it. My dad went to work one day, and there was this lady that he was working with. And he saw something in this lady. And he began to watch the way she lived her life. And he was like, and he, he told me, he said, I watched this lady. And he said, the more I watched her, the more I began to say to myself, wow, if I ever get religion, that's the kind that I want right there. Because this lady lived a life that was holy, that was set apart, that was so vastly different than what my dad did. My dad never told me all the stuff that he did as a kid until he was about 20. I mean, he did a lot of crazy stuff. And at the age of 21 years old, this lady affected him so much that he went to a church. And some old guy came up to my dad and said, hey, Jim Terry, do you want to pray? And he, my dad was like, I don't even know how to pray. He said, well, come with me. I'll help you out. Let's pray together. Why? Because he watched this lady live her life in a way that was different to where it was so attractive to him. He was living a life that was just a mess. I'm telling you, a mess. That's the way he told me. But he didn't tell me everything he ever did. But it was a mess. And he said, listen, this is different. I don't want this mess. I want different. And he started dating that lady's daughter. And they got married. And then I came along. And then my sister came along. And then God came to my dad and said, Jim Terry, I want you to preach. What? And so he went back to his home community with this testimony of there's something different. And when God comes into your life and he changes you, there's something different. And that's what makes Christ so attractive. Read the Gospels. I mean, there was a time when 5,000 men, not, not including, this didn't include all his, their families, because their families and children went along with them. Just men alone, 5,000 of them. So we don't even know how many were total, there totally. They, they, were, they were so interested in what Christ has, had to say. He was that attractive that where he went, thousands would flock to hear what he had to say. Something's different about this guy. Something's different. And then Christ says, listen, when you become my follower and you live a life that's holy, which is different, it's set apart. It's not better than, it's different, set apart. You, you become attractive. You become attractive to those people over there. The, the broad path, they'll turn around and they'll see, well, why are they different? What is it that attracts them? You're living a life that's holy. It's set apart. It's pure. And that's what Christ says. I will follow me. Take up your cross. Follow me. Do what I do. Peter says, and Paul, both of them said the same thing. Don't, don't mess with that old lifestyle. That old lifestyle is dead. You've been raised to a new life. That old life's gone. Now walk and be holy. Live different. Let's pray. Lord God, 
I pray that this morning you would take this message and you would begin to work on hearts of people and that you would show them that they are called to be different, that they have been called to be set apart, to be holy, a holy people. And that when they are holy, they're doing their best to be the model of Jesus Christ. They're living a life that follows Jesus Christ. It's different in that it becomes attractive. And Lord Jesus, you become attractive. And people see you and they think, what is different? I want that. I crave that. I need that. Because we put it away. We don't mess with that life anymore. We're following you. And we're allowing you to transform our inside. And when we're transformed into the likeness of Jesus Christ, you become the focal point and you are attractive to people, to those who are non-believers. They will want what we have. You, You are made attractive by us living a life that's holy, set apart, different. Lord God, I feel like you're moving on people's hearts right now. Give them strength. Give them connections with people in the church who who can help them along. And Lord, for those who are here this morning who, who are not your followers, Lord, I pray that you would help them to continue to come and listen to you. Lord, if even if it's not Brownwood Community Church, Lord, let them find that place where you are continuously being shown and, and, and you are just become more and more and more attractive till they want you above everything else. Lord God, we thank you for what you're going to do. We thank you for what you're doing in this very moment. And Lord God, as we go this week, help us to be attractive to, you, to, to the world. Help us to show the, your holiness in our life. Lord, it's going to be hard at certain times, but you have said that your power transforms us and you work through us. And when we allow you, when we submit to you, you transform us and you help us and you make us like Jesus Christ. And that's attractive. Pray you Help us this week to touch somebody's life. Every Christ follower here this morning, help us this week to touch somebody, to show Jesus Christ to somebody this week by living a life that's set apart and holy. Thank you, Lord, for that power that you have, that supernatural power that helps us along. And for what you do, we'll give you thanks and praise. In Jesus' name, amen.